We're going to have a mixture of things going on. Uh, I've already mentioned that there's going to be uh, some slides. Um, the nature of the demo, which is going to be seen on the big projection screen and the smaller ones to the side, um, is a hacking environment called Carly Linux. Um, so some people will call it a hacking environment, some people will call it a penetration testing uh, or ethical hacking, whatever tool you want to call it by, uh, it is a Linux environment specifically designed for compromising systems and testing their security. So we'll start off with the extreme health warning, and that is me, uh, that was done a few years ago at Networks Telecom. Um, today's event um, is going to be a, a live demo of a hack. Now I say in quote marks a hack because it's not going to be a genuine compromise of a genuine website, bypassing all the security controls uh, and therefore breaching all sorts of university rules and regulations. And I can't do that because the head of security is around here somewhere. I've lost him. He was somewhere in that area. There he is, right at the very back. And he'll be very upset with me if I really do break a university system. So what I've done is I have constructed an environment which we're going to use as the target. So this computer here, this laptop, is my hacking workstation. And it is connected, there's a wire leading down here, to the university network. So I am directly connected to it. The location where my target is, is on a server inside my office over in the Portland Square building and is a genuine server. It is running Windows Server 2008 R2. It has a MySQL database, a PHP uh, interpretive platform for the scripting. It is a genuine web server. I installed it a few weeks ago specifically for today's session. I have not broken it, I have not deliberately weakened it, I have merely set it up according to the Microsoft recommendations. So it is, as best I can make it, a genuine demo. I have then placed things on top of that to give me something interesting to attack. But other than that, it is a genuine web server, and the scenario we're going to play out is an exact replica of a real-life scenario that really happened at this university. So it is all based in reality, but... It is a very controlled experiment, and I say that knowing full well that I spent most of the morning trying to make it work today. Um, it should run smoothly, uh, but the usual health warning, please do not try this at home. Please do not go out and find the appropriate targets online and start hitting them with these tools. Because all of these tools are out there, they're all freely available, uh, and they all do work, and it's really quite scary. Um, today we're going to look at a, um, a particular web service, I'll explain about that in just a moment. Um, we're obviously going to have a very controlled attack, and I'm going to walk you through it. Um, because some of the text may not be readable on the side screens, I will have a, um, an overview on the big slides here, which tries to explain what I'm attempting to do. And the idea is that we're going to start off by identifying a potential vulnerable service. So what do we want to compromise? What system are we going to hit? Um, we will then exploit some vulnerabilities on that system. Okay, going through the web. So this is all genuine, you could do it from home. I actually did test this from my home network through the BT infrastructure, through to Janet, through to my server, all worked perfectly. Okay, this is a genuine attack. Um, once I've got through to the server, I will then attempt to gain a level of remote access. I'll do that a few different ways, but it will end up with having a command line shell, a command interpreter, DOS prompt on the server under my remote control. So that's a nightmare scenario. Um, but that will be very limited, so I will then escalate my privileges. I will gain the administrator privileges so that I can then do a real attack and cause some real damage. And I have to have this all done by, I think it's 12.30, uh, or some of the scripts on the server won't kick in at the right time um, to show you certain things. Um, and then we'll probe the internal network, so I must get on. So first of all, where do we find our targets? Now, if I'm an attacker and I want to bring down the University of Plymouth, well, it's relatively easy to find the University of Plymouth. Okay, they've got a big public presence, a big website. But the chances are the University website, hopefully, and certainly Paul at the back will hope it is, will hope that that is very well protected. And so I'm not going to necessarily waste too much time hitting that. What's far more interesting is to find targets that have been forgotten about. Okay, somebody somewhere, once upon a time, built a server, stuck it online to test something, and then forgot about it. That, again, is quite a common situation. So you can go off looking for these things using various tools. You can scour the web, hunting for your targets. There are automated tools that will help you with doing that. There's one particular website called Shodan, which I'll show you in just a moment, where we can automate it and find these vulnerable hosts. And of course, depending on the groups that we mingle with, we could be talking on the underground economy, hiding under what's called the dark net. Now, you probably can't see this particularly well, uh, but I went to this website, pentesttools.com, 
This is a website that allows you to do various, very simple um, diagnostic searches, checks for things, including um, subdomains. So if you're not familiar with a subdomain, um, we are CSCAN, the Centre for Security <coughs> Communications and Network Research. Our website is www.cscan.org. I don't care about that one. That one's probably well protected. So I went to this particular website, that's the URL for it, and I searched for all the subdomains of cscan.org to try and find out what other domains they host, what other um, names they've registered under that domain. And you will see we have FTP, VPN, Test, Dev, and www. Those are the aliases, they are the subdomains of the cscan.org domain. That's a free search. I just went to the website, I didn't have to prove identity, nothing required to evidence that I'm entitled to the information, anybody can do it. I could have done it at a command prompt with a few little commands under Linux, but far easier, there's a website that does it for you. So just go to there, plug in the data, and you can probably guess that one, test.cscan.org, is the one I'm interested in for today. Okay? And I've set it up specifically for today's activity. And if you go to that website, you won't see it, but that's what you get. That is a website, that is the Joomla website, and if I open up good old Ice Weasel, for those of you who know Linux, there is the Ice Weasel interface. You'll see it on my live screen, I can't uh, move my bits around very well. But if I type in test.cscan.org, you will see it will connect to the website. That is absolutely genuine. Okay, if you want to see where I'm connecting from, if I can find my... Uh, Man prompt. So you can just about see on those screens, hopefully buried in there is the IP address. That there, 141.163.37.176, that is my computer. And if I were to do an NS lookup of test.cscan.org, and it doesn't help type when we have cold hands, by the way, it's not really working very well. But testcscan.org, bring it up the screen a bit, you will see it is on 96.251. So it's the same university network, 141.163, class B network. Um, but you can see that I have connected to a remote system. So this is as genuine as I can make it. I happen to be inside the university network, but that doesn't give me any extra level of access. Okay, this is exactly the same as if I do it from home, and I tried it last night to make sure. So that is the, uh, the IPs. We saw the server a second ago, if I can try and move my screens around. Normally I have a much bigger screen resolution so I can see things more easily. But we can see straight away we've got that same interface. So I am connecting to that particular website. Now, if I wasn't sure, or if I just wanted to cause havoc worldwide, I mentioned Shodan just a moment ago. So Shodan, I went onto it at the weekend, did a quick search for any Joomla websites. So if you're not familiar with Joomla, it's a content management system. Very quick way of getting a blog up and running, but much like WordPress, uh, Drupal, and many other products. Joomla uh, is still a very popular platform. I did a very constrained search for this particular one. This is a saved report I generated. And you can see that there's quite a few of the instances that I was looking for within the UK. So this is automatically building my target list. I can export this report, and I've now got a series of IPs that I may well want to target. So now knowing that I have a Joomla system, which is potentially vulnerable, okay, I could spend a bit of time now analysing the website, searching through the contents of that website to try and find what's on there. But of course, I like my automated tools. So if I go back into here, Scroll down the screen a little bit, and if I try, I'm going to try and see where I am now. So I am currently in the root directory. So if I change into the desktop, where I've conveniently placed a few files, and you'll see I have a script called Joomla.pl. So basically, I went online. I did a search for Joomla version X. It happens to be an old version, but there are vulnerabilities in all the new ones as well. Did a search for that particular version. Found a website that listed a series of vulnerabilities and several websites that provide example exploit scripts. So if I now type in Perl jjoomla.pl and target that particular website, and I apologise if you can't see the text too clearly, I basically typed in uh, this command Perl to run the Perl interpreter, the script jc.pl, and then targeting that same website, and you'll see live on the screens, but you'll also see it here in its previously constructed form, that it will go off and connect to the website. It will query the website to find out if it is vulnerable to this kind of an attack. It's a very specific attack. It will then attempt to upload some content to the server. And if it does so, and it actually has worked successfully, it will then try and change the name of that content to make it into a different uh, kind of scripting language that we can then execute. And it will then verify that it is accessible. 
So what you see at the end here is a verification that a file has been uploaded to the Joomla website. Now you will notice I did not have to type in a username or password, and yet I have been able to upload content to a publicly visible web server with no authentication whatsoever. This is a known vulnerability in this particular version of Joomla. It's because of the Joomla content editor, the JCE. And with this particular version, if you upload to a very specific path in a very specific format, you don't need to authenticate. It will place those files into a known location in the slash, the root directory, images, stories, and it will then put the file there. That file will be placed there with a, PA, that's with a, um, a GIF, PNG, or JPEG extension based on what you've uploaded. It's to allow you to upload images. But we can then take that image and we can rename it. And you'll see that happens in the uh, third step. It changes the GIF file it just uploaded into a PHP script, which I can then access <coughs> using the URL down there. So if I now try and go to that particular location, and you'll see that I've done this many times. So there is the URL. So this is, again is me talking to the web server using a script that I have just uploaded to it. This is not on the server originally. This is a script that that little tool has just uploaded to the server. As a consequence of that upload, I can now drag any file onto that particular website. So if I sh just move this down and move this one a little out of the way as well. Unfortunately, my screen has been resized and I can't actually see the files that I need. So I'll need to... Um, there we go. So these are the files I was looking for. There's the Joomla.pl file. You can see that one in the middle there. That's the one that we just ran that ex exploited the server. You'll see there's a script here called test.php. So hopefully, if I can... I might be able to drag and drop easily. So if I browse for it, select that test.php script, upload it to the server, Ignoring the language you get back, this is written by hackers, you will see that it uploaded with success. Okay, not a particularly uh, eloquent version. Um, now we know that that particular file was called test.php, and we'll be able to test to see if it's worked by changing the URL. And if I now go to test.php, you will see that what I get back is the word test. So not very interesting, but if we have a look at what that script actually contained, You'll see that it's a relatively simple script, and if you know PHP, I'll see if I can make that a bit larger, I don't think I can, not going to let me. Um, you'll see that that particular bit of code simply echoes the word test back to the user. So what I'm demonstrating here is that I've been able to upload a file to the server, in addition to my original hack. That file has now been executed by the server, it's been run as local code. Now, echoing the word test back to a screen is not particularly interesting. So if any of you have heard of a C99 script, uh, this is a far more interesting thing to do to the server. And you'll see that there's a C99.php script here. And if I open that up, you're probably not going to be able to read that. That's all gibberish. And it's part of the protection mechanism of this particular bit of software. It's all encrypted or encoded, so you can't read it. What's more interesting is to see what it does. So if I now go back to my web browser, go to the c99.php script, you will see that what I get, and it's not massively clear from the screen, is a user interface. This is now running on the remote web server. So I've uploaded my script to a university-hosted web server. That web server is now executing that live on the system, and it is showing me the directory contents. If we have a look down here, you will see that there are directories. I can go up the directories. I'm now looking at a higher level directory, and you'll see that there's various images and things here, so we're still in the images folder, and I can then move back up again, and that should take me, and you'll just about be able to read c colon slash inetpub www root. We're now in the top level of the web server, so I can now see all of the web files, and if we just scroll down, we'll see somewhere down here the configuration.php script, which contains the setup configuration for this blog. So I'm building access now to the server. I can now navigate the entire file system. But I don't have to stop there. I could go even higher in the directory system. And if I just go to the very, very top level, you will see that I'm now at the point where I can go into the program directories, where I can go into the user folders. I can go into the Windows directory. So in other words, I can access anything on the server. Now, that's not strictly true. I am connected to this web server as a web user. And the web user account is somewhat limited. So I've actually skipped over some of my slides. That's what I did a minute ago. That was uploading the script. That then caused that to execute. 
So I've got to there. I can navigate the system, but I can't do a great deal because I'm just an anonymous web browser. I don't really have a user account on the server. I need to get a user account. So that's my next task. Now there's a few steps that I'm going to go through first. So I now want to have a look in the INET pub folder. So this is the web server. There we go, there's INET pub. So that's where the web files are located. I go into www root. Go down here and you remember I mentioned the configuration.php script. So if I have a look at configuration.php, I can now read the contents of the script file living on the server. Now no one should be able to do that, because that's where you put all your secret information. And the bit I'm looking for is going to be somewhere towards the top, just here. Now again, you probably can't read that very well, but hopefully I have a slide that will show that. So within that configuration script are these entries. The host, the user, the password, the database, and the database prefix. This is the configuration of the database that provides access to Joomla, or Joomla uses to get access to all the content. So this is where the stuff is stored. Now it's not probably a very privileged user account, but it is the user account under which all the PHP scripting accesses the database. So we know that there's some interesting stuff going on there. Now what I want to do is try and get into that content management system. I want to have admin rights on there. Uh, and in order to do that, I need to be able to get out some information from the server. So, so far I've managed to get loads of stuff onto the system. Um, I now need to um, extract some data from it to be able to break these passwords. Uh, and I know a little bit about how Joomla stores passwords. But first of all, I need to get that encrypted data off of the server. So in order to do that, I've already pre-uploaded a series of scripts. MySQL.php is a simple script that I wrote, and I can show you the content of that in a moment if you're interested. Um, but it will basically use these credentials that we had on screen a second ago. So writing some PHP script that connects with that user, that password, to that database, will then find the user's table, find the admin account, which happens to be of type super administrator, and it will then present on screen any user accounts that match that particular criteria. And if we have a look on here, we can see that we found the admin user, we found the username and the password. Okay, so we've got the password there, but you obviously can't read that. And that information, again, if I jump forward on here, is stored in this format, and if you break it down, you can see it's in two equal length strings separated by a colon marker. So that is a hash and a salt. Now, we haven't got time to talk about hashing and salting, uh, but those two bits of information combined allow us to encrypt a password. And we haven't got time to look at the detail of that. Um, but I don't know what that password is. I have no way of knowing that. However, I do know that most users will choose bad passwords, given half a chance. And whoever set up this system will have been asked to provide a password. And I happen to be able to go online and download the top 500 passwords, or the top 10,000, or the top 100,000. I can download any size of password list that I want. So I've already preloaded a script. I'll try and execute it for you. And what this will do is it will go through, you'll see it disappear on the screen very, very quickly there, it will go through and try a number of different passwords. And it will try them one by one from that top 500 list, and it will take the password, and it will apply this algorithm. Take a password, add the salt value, which is the second block here, run it through the hash algorithm, just a simple single line of code, MD5 bracket, password plus the salt, generate a, a value out of it and compare it to what's in the database. And if it's what's in the database, we've broken the password. And if we scroll down on the system, you'll see it tried loads and loads of passwords, and right down at the very bottom there is password is Joomla. Scroll it all the way to the top. Obviously, again, I've set it up deliberately to be a relatively weak one and to make sure it existed in the dictionary file. But if the dictionary didn't find it, I just try a bigger dictionary and a bigger one and a bigger one again. Or I take that hash value and I go and find a website that does it. And there's lots of websites that do it, including some that charge you. You can go to a particular website that will break certain kinds of hashes for about $17, and it tries half a million passwords. So if you haven't got the password database you need, you go online. It runs on Amazon EC2. It's a web-based service. Anyone can access it. <coughs> so I've now got the administrator account. Uh, if I wanted to, I could prove that I can now log in. So if I go all the way back through to find our Joomla system, we went through quite a few screens already. Nearly there. There we go, there's Joomla. And you'll see that there's a login entry down here. So we can try admin. But of course, you all believe me, I'll be able to log in straight away. 
We won't bother saving it. And we've now been able to log in, and you'll see that the login prompt will have now disappeared further down here, and we can actually log out. So in those few moments, we've managed to access the server remotely, been able to upload content to it to compromise the server. We've now been able to upload further scripts that do further activities. We've found the username and password for the administrator account on the Joomla system. I still can't compromise the server. All I can do is add content to the blog. That might cause embarrassment for the organization, maybe extortion. I can delete things from the database now. But if I can post, I can remove it. Um, and I can create more users. That could be quite useful. Create additional user accounts so that if somebody notices and changes the password, I keep my access. Of course, I can simply rerun the exploit. But what I really want to do is get direct access onto the server. So if we go back into our C99 script, get the right uh, folder. So there was our um, wrong one, C99. Here's our web interface. You'll see that there's a link here for shell. So the shell link allows me to run a command on the server, just as if I was sat there typing at it. So if I type in dir, it's a Windows server, hit go, within a few seconds what comes back is the directory listing. Now we've seen that already. I can do that through the GUI, but now I can do it interactively. Now again, you saw earlier I could upload any files I wanted. So again, just to make it quicker, I pre-uploaded some additional things. I've uploaded a tool called Netcat. Now that's mentioned in these slides here. And Netcat is a very clever little tool that will let me throw things backwards and forwards across a network between two typically command prompts. So on my computer here, so this is my, uh, my laptop, I'm going to start a Netcat process listening. So NC for Netcat, minus L to listen, minus P80 to listen on port 80. Now I'm doing this because, in my mind, this server is in an organization. The organization probably has a firewall and have probably restricted traffic in one direction or other. Now, as it happens, this server is behind the firewall and the firewall does restrict access. So working on that assumption, I'm going to send stuff out over port 80 because port 80 is web browsing. And in many organizations, web browsing just goes straight through a firewall. So hoping that's the case, if anyone were to look at it, they would simply see traffic going from a server inside the organization, talking to an outside web server. Well, that's quite normal. Hopefully, I'll evade detection. So running that, I'm now listening. So my laptop is now waiting for someone to connect to me so that I can then interact with them. Let's go back to our web server. Now you'll see again, I've done this several times as tests. I've got loads of previously stored ones. So I've got to check my IP address. So I am on 37176. So I apologize if you're not able to read that. Um, and I've not got a version here that's very clear. But NC is the name of Netcat. So run Netcat. Connect to an IP address. I'm using 141.163.137.176. Uh, on port 80. But run the command interpreter. Run a DOS shell. So what this should do is when it gets run on the server, the server should execute that instruction, that will load the Netcat program. Netcat will then make a connection to my laptop and will run the command interpreter, the DOS shell, on the web server, but present all the input output to me. In other words, I will be remotely controlling that shell. This is where we cross our fingers. You may have seen in the background something moved. If I go back into that background window, and if I scroll up, you will see this is a Mac. This is running a Linux platform. Clearly, it shouldn't look like Windows. And yet, if you look at that command prompt, it says C colon slash inetpub slash www root slash images slash stories. I am now talking to the web server. And if I do a DIR in that location, you will see all the same files that are on the server that we saw with the server script. But I'm now talking to it locally. So from my laptop, I am now running a command prompt on the server. And I can now do effectively anything off this system. So if I want to check, and I must remember I'm on Windows, <coughs> I want to check the IP address, I can do. That is the IP address, the IP configuration of the server at the other end. So I'm now having a level of remote control. I've been running so far as the anonymous user, and I have no means of issuing um, system administrator commands on this system. Okay? So I want that extra level of privileges. In order to achieve that, I have to escalate my privilege, privileges to be the super user. 
Now, in order to do that, I want to look on the server to find something, something else that runs with the correct privileges. I don't have the right privileges, but I want to give myself them. So I'm going to go hunting on the server, as you can probably guess, I've already pre-prepared this. There is a folder on the server called Backup. And if I look up in the Backup folder, we will see a whole series of backup files, .sqls. Okay, all of those files are just backups to the database. So this is the system administrator who set up the server, me in this particular case, and set up an automated process to back up the database. Something that happens on most servers. You want an automated system to do the backups. But in order to work, that script has to run with the admin privileges. So if I can modify that script to run my command, I should be able to run something else with admin privileges. So if I look down this page, there will be a mysql.bat file. And if I go to edit, and you'll see basically what I'm trying to achieve is already on this screen, we have here a script that was written by the administrator of this system to do those backup processes. And I've already typed in at the bottom here this extra bit of code that I want. So if I scroll, so that you can see it a little bit clearer, again, not great, you'll see there is a command that's commented out in this particular script. And what I want to do is to start, so start means execute, run, this file, remember NC already, I'm going to actually do it over port 443, just to be a bit different, um, to run that and run the command interpreter. So in other words, using this script, which will run with admin rights, cause a new instance of netcat to be executed. Load up another version. Now this is the bit that I'm going to have to tweak a little bit, I'm afraid. But if I save that, I've now commented out the start, so you can just about see on this screen that start has now been edited slightly. And I go down to the save button. On the server, I have now saved that change. The script has now been modified. Okay, we can see now that it's there. It's all ready to go. Now what should have happened is I tweaked this script, and rather than running once a day at three in the morning, I had scheduled it to run every three minutes from 12 o'clock till 12.30, which should have coincided with the processing of this particular activity. So I wouldn't have had to find a way to execute it. So now I've got to break the magic. I've now got to go back into that server and cause it to run. But in order to do that, what I'm going to do first of all is just load up another command window and find it. Okay, we'll get, go out of this particular shell. We know it's not the one we want, so we'll leave that one. There's net, netcat, the same netcat command we had earlier, but now I'm going to listen on port 443. So this system is now waiting for this magical new connection to come in. <laughs> Go back to here and look, the magic has happened as if by magic. I'm not finished, by the way, but that's very much appreciated. I have now got a command shell on the server, and if I type in who am I, you will see I am now the administrator. So I have now gained admin rights on a server in my office all over the web, ignoring that little VPN server bit. That should have been automated. Now, in reality, no server, probably, is set up to run a script every two minutes to back up its databases. I do have one server that does it every 15 minutes, but on the whole, that's not normal. So what would be far more likely is I were to compromise that backup script or some other time process. That script would then be running maybe at night, 3 o'clock in the morning, However, most servers don't go into power save mode. I'm a hacker, I don't care about my power, I can leave this running. So I would start that netcat process listening and just leave it there. And at three in the morning, when that new server comes online, reboots, does whatever it needs to do on that task, that netcat process is started, links up to my desktop, my laptop here, and it just sits there waiting. It's not gonna time out. Could do if the network falls over, but as a general rule, this will keep running for hours. I'm now on the server. So I can now do absolutely everything. Now what I want to do is get an administrator account. Okay, now again, I've preloaded some tools, but all I have to do is drag them in. We saw that upload script, and upload anything. So I'm gonna type in, in the right location. So we go to the root folder, into inet pub, www root. I go into images, stories, because I happen to remember where all this stuff is do a DIR, and you will see that there is a tool there called PWW7. Up on screen here is what you should see. So PWW7 is run, and you get this dump here. And again, I did this last night over the network, got a dump of all the usernames and passwords. And we can see here a number of passwords um, all hashed up. 
So they're encrypted values, we can't tell what they are. So as you can probably guess, I found a tool that would do this. There are websites that would do this. This is a tool called Offcrack. Okay, Offcrack freely available. You can download dictionary tables or rainbow tables of passwords, which you then load up into it. And you can see it's got two tables running here, and it's broken one of the passwords quite quickly. I stopped it after a while. 27 minutes in, it had broken one of the passwords. And that password was this hash with password wizard1 exclamation mark. Now, that isn't a great password, but at least it has upper, lower numbers and symbols. It shouldn't have been easily broken. That was done in about 15 minutes with two freely available rainbow table sets uh, and about 800 billion passwords within them. And we're not talking about the really big tables. In total, that's about one, one and a half gigs worth of data uh, in terms of the passwords. I can download a 160 gig password table um, and that would give me a much larger set of passwords, much higher chance of success. And that's free. Now, again, I'm going to try and do it, but I suspect it's not going to work properly. Uh, but the next step was having now got not only into the server, not only running an admin level script, um, and not only being able to dump any things in there, I've got the username and password for the web server. So I can now take control of that server if I can connect to it. And there's all sorts of ways in which I could do that. I will try issuing a nmap command, and I'll try doing it for the, uh, the network. It is working, fantastic. So what this is doing is it's going off and it's scanning the local network, looking for computers, looking for systems. It's found a few. There they are on the screen, uh, all the details of it. Again, we haven't got time to look into the detail of it because of all the little problems that have gone wrong. But the one I'm interested in is this Netgear box or pair of boxes down here. Um, Netgear make all sorts of devices, but what they do make is NASes. And if we have a look at an individual's uh, IP address and do another Nmap search, we can get a list of all the services running on it. Okay, and that will tell us what kind of network services are available. One of those is the Microsoft DS port 445 service, network file sharing. Okay, this is a NAS, I can connect to it, I can access it. Now, I could start hunting for all these things in a bit more detail, but to sort of guide you along the way, the next command I would do would be netview to find out what network shares are available on that particular system. Okay, so what exists as a share on that remote server, and that will give me a list of all of these shares. The next step would have been to try and access it. Now, I don't have credentials for that server. I would try the credentials I've already hacked, the Joomla account, I would try the account of the, um, uh, the Windows administrator, that might get me in, but I can also try all sorts of other tools. And Hydra is a tool that will do multiple password guesses as well as username guesses. And you might recognize again, top 500. I'm feeding in that password list. So I could run this, go off, run it for several hours if need be. It could be 500, it could be 500,000 passwords. And eventually, it will come up with this at the bottom saying that it has managed to compromise the user account, hack me. And if you remember back to the previous slide, one of the usernames was hack me. I found that, and I found the password for this particular NAS box. And you'll see that the password in this particular case is amateur. Having got those credentials, I can then use another command. So all of these things work at the command line. I'll try this one. Net use, Z colon, and I've got to get the syntax right, 192.168.1.23. That's the IP address of the Netgear NAS. I will connect to the disk images folder. And I will log in with the password amateur against username. And if I type this in wrong, it's not going to work. Hack me. Hopefully, it will work. You will see that I'm now connected. Where are we? The big screens. I've connected to that particular network share. If I now have a look on Drive Z, I can navigate that network share. Again, this is all from a command prompt running on my server. And you will see that there are a bunch of uh, folders there. Naturally, I have pre-created a folder called Secrets, and if we have a look in there, we will see, there we go, that there is a file called embarrassing.jpg. Can you guess what we might be about to get? So if I see what folder I'm in on the C drive, you'll see I'm in the Stories folder still. I'll go back to Z, and then I will have to finish. Copy start on the C drive. So what I've done is I've gone to the network share, having broken into it, I've retrieved the files off of the network share. I've now put those files on the web server. So that means I can access them over the web, hopefully. So let's finish off 
And if this does work, it will be a minor miracle. Let's find the browser. There we go. Images, stories. Embarrassing. And I can't remember what the file name was. Was it a JPEG or a PNG? Anyone remember? There we go. And for those of you who don't recognize that beautiful face, that is Steve Fennell. Um, he is the, uh, the chair of today's event. Um, and that was a demo.